In 2012, there was an open Senate seat in New Mexico that a former governor mm -mm. used to give us another liberty senators. Why did you opt not to do that instead? Per, instead, you pursue the quixotic and I think foolish decision to try to get 5% of the vote, which ultimately failed. Well, um, I think that um, uh, what is the amendments to the Constitution that allowed for uh, the election of senators? As opposed to 17, thank you. So uh, I think that the 17th Amendment would have never been adopted, that we would not be in the position that we're in today. I don't think there would be any deficit at all today. So, I really believe um, that Congress uh, and the U.S. Senate, <laughs> at the end of the day, is a job that's judged by how much bacon you bring home, and that they are directly responsible for us being in the situation that we are in, the $20 trillion uh, national debt. And I don't want to have any part of dulling up to that trough and adding to it, because like I say, at the end of the day, that's what gets you elected or, or re-elected. So I guess I'm the opposite of the last guy. Uh, I turned 18 in 2012, and I wanted to start by thanking you for letting me, giving me the option to vote for freedom and for liberty yeah. on the president. question is, what is the first thing you would do if you were elected president? First thing I would do if I were elected president was the same thing that I did when I got elected uh, governor of New Mexico. Was I immersed myself in the dollars and cents of state government and what what's the money being spent and uh, what's, you know, what are we getting for the money that we're, we're spending? And I immersed myself in that. I became more familiar with the uh, with the beans than anybody else, and that gave me a power to, uh, to genuinely reduce the size of government, something that had never happened before, and I would do the same as President of the United States. I would immerse myself in the beans, and I would come out with a cognitive plan to cut government by 20%, which would, in essence, balance the federal budget. And to do that, of course, you know, you're, you're talking about the um, Medicaid and Medicare, uh, military spending, which is nobody seems to want to touch any of those, but if we don't, um, I, I believe we're going to find ourselves without a country. I, I believe that the end game here with the spending and continuing to spend what we're spending will be a monetary collapse at some point. It will be a bond market collapse, and, and that's going to be really, really ugly, and that's going to be liberty and freedom that's going to be taken away from every single one of us um, living lives that we never dreamed of living in. By the way, monetary collapse is not something that the government announces is going to happen two weeks from Thursday. There's going to be a monetary collapse. Go <laughs> take all the money that you have and spend it because two weeks from tomorrow it won't be worth anything. That's what happens in a monetary collapse. Money's not, what happens in a monetary collapse is there's no groceries at the grocery store because you're, the dollars that you have don't buy it. Hi, Gary. Oh, thank you. Uh, hi, Gary. I'm Andreas Altrich, go American University. I think I dropped your name last night in Al Jazeera, which is pretty cool. Uh, my question is, uh, regarding the current election, we see Trump and Hillary doing very well, but they're the most disliked kind of candidates like, historically. So what does that mean about our current system, and what does that mean about uh, your campaign? Well, <coughs> so <coughs> the Republican has to go out and garner support, and, and I was front line on this, running as a Republican to start out with in 2012. But the Republican has to garner the support of 30% of the far right. And the Democrat has to go out and garner the support of 30% of the far left. When 50% of Americans now say that they're independent, um, what you're left with with the two major candidates is solid support by 30% of the electorate. That's what you're left with. And then it becomes a choice of the, of the lesser of, uh, you know, which is, which is going to be worse. Um, and I, I can't, I'm... <laughs> Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> I made the same pitch. I made the same pitch to New Mexicans that Donald Trump is making to America. Look, I'm a really successful business guy. I'm just going to bring a common sense business approach to state government and just watch how well it works. And I got elected and it really did work well. But I never, ever said anything as crazy 
as I'm going to deport 11 million illegal immigrants. I never said anything as crazy as I'm going to build a fence across the, the border. I never said anything as crazy as I'm going to kill the families of Muslim uh, terrorists. Who's going to arbitrate over that one? And then I never said anything as crazy as I'm for all for free trade. And I'm going to force Apple to make their iPads and iPhones in the United States. <laughs> Thank you. We have time for one more question. Hey, Governor Johnson, uh, it's great to, to hear you. I've been a uh, big supporter for many years. I'm actually with Yerlichka. We met in the summer and the guy who set up uh, Liberal And I would like to say that I hope... I hope your Black Friday scenario doesn't happen here in the United States. Uh, but if it does, if it falls apart, I, I would like to say that you're always welcome. In the <laughs> I would love to have you. We're doing a, a big festival, something like Burning Man in Liberland, and you are very welcome uh, to come there. And, and I wish you good luck in the presidential race. Thank you. Johnson. Woo!